It seems now, since Gen Alpha has come into more relevance as of late, that the cycle upon which the world picks on the freshman generation has continued anew. I specifically call Generation Alpha the current freshman generation because the way in which the world picks on young people isn't too dissimilar from my experience in high school. Keep in mind, not every high school is like this, but the one I went to had a culture of bullying the freshman class. While upperclassmen were berating the freshmen by claiming they're all stupid, hyper-energetic, and look like they're 12, teachers would contribute to this bullying culture by enforcing some rules exclusively on freshmen. This bullying is treated in a similar way to college frat hazing rituals. You're hazed because you're new, and by surviving it you feel like you've earned the right to haze the next batch of newbies. It's as if you're sourcing catharsis for your mistreatment by enacting it on others. In a broader societal context outside of the school setting, this cycle becomes a carousel of oppression that takes advantage of previously oppressed groups' jealousy of more privileged groups in the social hierarchy. I specifically say more privileged and not unoppressed because there's no such thing as a completely unoppressed group. If your assumption is that a white or neurotypical or financially well-to-do person is free from oppression, your ideals of liberation, the absence of oppression, will be flawed. It's this exact feeling that's extremely pervasive to groups lower on the social hierarchy, which is taken advantage of by carousels of oppression to keep such a cycle alive. For instance, people of color who believe these flawed assumptions will paint a whitewashed picture of liberation. They will assume that racial liberation in media means being able to emulate the cool white people they see on television and in the movies. However, when one thinks beyond the carousel of oppression, real liberation looks less like emulating groups higher on the social hierarchy, such as whites, and instead means being themselves in their own unique ways to have an equal platform to other races instead of doing the same things they do but with a different skin tone. A black character in media is not a white character with a different skin tone. A black character is someone who has unique experiences and struggles from their white counterparts. Maybe a white character struggles to feel like they've actually earned some of their success due to racist hiring policies, and meanwhile a black character is frustrated that they work hard for those same opportunities but are never given the chance. This not only makes for more accurate racial depictions, but also increasingly fleshed out characters and plot lines. Another example in the broader social context of carousels of oppression would be the feminist movement. Instead of trying to emulate the experience of white people as their blueprint for liberation, they're instead trying to emulate the supposed greater sex. Civil rights progress starts to be put in this narrow view where liberation only means being able to do the same things as males in society, like voting, careers, enlistment, and, unfortunately, the ability to oppress. While they weren't exactly new during the Gamergate era, a spotlight was put on man-hating feminists during that time who directed their bitterness and the struggle for civil rights at men generally, and not the structures and people in power upholding patriarchy. This obviously ended up hurting the optics of the movement, but also narrowed the view of what proper gender liberation looks like. It's not the ability to emulate men, but rather the analysis that patriarchy is a system that sacrifices men to hurt women, and that while both sexes have some needs that must be fulfilled equally, such as rates of pay in the workplace, they both also have unique needs like reproductive rights or sexual etiquette. Anyways, my main point here is that your blueprint for liberation needs to be about what you specifically need from society, and not about emulating all the people who don't have to deal with the same problems as you do. Some would say that this is the difference between equality and equity, but obviously removing the oppression in the first place would be preferable to both. Sure, these groups might embody the level of comfort you're trying to achieve, but not the exact lifestyle you should be aiming for. I'm sticking to my guns on this point because it kills me a little inside to hear transgender friends of mine tell me they wish they were cis after dealing with transphobia, or people of color telling me they wish they were white after being called a bunch of racial slurs that afternoon. Do not compromise on your ideals of liberation nor your identity. You should show the bigots what for by being both liberated and a minority. An ideal world is one where these two things are not mutually exclusive. Getting back to how this carousel of oppression plays into generations and age as an identity, it's even more fast-paced and circular compared to the same effect happening with gender and race, and is similar to how we treat people in some high schools and colleges. I think this behavior of hazing the newbies is so strong because, by the time you're older, you don't realize that the same shitty things you're saying about the current freshman generation are the same shitty things people said about you when you were in those same shoes. I get really tired of seeing videos that degrade Gen Alpha because they're on the internet a lot at a young age, and how they assume that the majority of that usage is for dumb things like skidibi toilet or whatever. I get even more pissed when I see self-righteous Gen Zers in the comments talking about how Gen Alpha is doomed, and how they had better experiences in their childhoods. Listen, I am part of Gen Z, and don't you dare try to tell me that the lot of you didn't watch stupid things like YouTube poop when you were their age. 
Similarly to Gen Alpha, Gen Z spent plenty of time on the internet at a young age. We just don't like to think negatively of it because it was during times that we look back at with rose-tinted glasses, such as cool math games in the computer lab or YouTube while waiting for the bus after school. We're all dumb, cringy gremlins when we're young. Don't pretend you weren't just because the new young people are doing a different flavor of the same thing. Pushing aside this generational elitism, Gen Alpha isn't without their own novel problems. Social media algorithms are more predatory than they used to be, and their schooling environments are more dangerous and underfunded for when I was their age. Fresh generations experiencing unique problems isn't new. Gen Z has to struggle with a tougher entry-level job market, the whiplash of becoming adults or graduating during the pandemic, and soaring rent prices making it harder to move out from our parents' place. But you know what wasn't helpful to hear when I was younger? That we're doomed because we wouldn't amass as much wealth as the boomers? That we're cursed to rent forever and work ourselves to the bone? Do you think any of us wanted to hear that when we were budding young teenagers? Hell no! So why do we find it acceptable to say the same things about the struggles of the next generation? One of the healthiest things to happen to intergenerational bonds was the camaraderie between millennials and Gen Z due to our shared problems and blurred generational lines. Younger generations are being hit the hardest by the world's slip into the beginning of late-stage capitalism. We've seen multiple once-in-a-lifetime economic crashes, a dying internet, a rebirth of American fascism, the death of happy, easy-going America, and what's worse is that, while millennials and some of Gen Z might have gotten a small taste of those before times to compare the modern nightmare to, Gen Alpha will not have that luxury. These are the times they're growing up in. Their only recollection of what the world was like before the pandemic, before 2016, before 2008, before the forever wars, before the dot-com bubble, will be the history books. The last thing they need to hear is that they're doomed from the beginning. In the way we categorize ourselves, we are constantly encouraged to abandon what our oppressors want us to consider as inconvenient groups. Gen Z and millennial camaraderie, but not Gen Alpha. Christian and Jewish coalitions, but not Muslims. LGB, but not the T. Feminism, but not trans women. Leftist outreach, but not white guys. Obviously, not every inconvenient group deserves to be absorbed into a larger movement, but when oppressed people with legitimate struggles are in their own category, it becomes shockingly easy to see them as a drag on the larger movement and chop them off. This is no different than how some of those doomery Gen Alpha videos want Gen Z and millennials to look at the issue. They want Gen Alpha to look like a lost cause and too much trouble to integrate into the current social coalition between Gen Z and millennials. Now, I've stressed this many times, and I will continue to do so because it's a lesson that seems to need repeating. But nobody is a lost cause. Liberation is not supposed to be convenient. Some people will be on board without much issue. Some people will be dragged into a better world kicking and screaming. Some people will require more attention than others because of where they came from. But overall, the last thought you want to have in your mind when walking the path towards liberation is that some people are beyond help. For example, there have been plenty of programs to reduce the amount of people in solitary confinement, and they've been successful in doing so, leaving only dozens instead of hundreds in its confines. To give up in this instance is to say that these remaining people are beyond saving. But the proper revolutionary instead asks, what new methods can we invent to help these people? This is the question I want to see asked as we observe Gen Alpha's developments over the years. They have new problems, and it's up to revolutionaries to find solutions to those problems. We didn't give up on other inconvenient groups that were enticing to leave behind, and there's no reason to do differently anytime soon. As the socialist U.S. presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs once said, When I rise, it will be with the ranks, not from the ranks.